Thank you for coming. My name is Dmitry Levin. I'm the maintainer of First Trace since about 2009. And today I'll talk about modern strays. What is a modern strays? Where does the traditional strays end and the modern strays begin? Um, maybe traditional strays is something that is well known, but well known to whom? Uh, what if you know the whole of strays? Uh, does it mean that there is no traditional stress for you? Probably not. So, as it getting too subjective, I decided to, to use a more universal definition of modern stress uh, as a stress that I maintain. Uh, <laughs> so, let's assume that all the stress features introduced since 2009 are modern and all that are much earlier than this, are traditional. But before diving into modern features, how does it work? Let me see. Oh, it, it works. Great. Before diving into modern features, I would like to say a few words uh, just to recall traditional, uh, traditional strays a bit. Uh, all features of traditional strays, they could be split in several, like, more or less arbitrary, into several groups. Like, those features that control a stress output in different ways, like whether to collect and print instruction pointers, whether to collect and print timestamps, and if yes, then are how to print them. Uh, uh, how to collect and print strings, I mean, the size, format, how to print them. Uh, how uh, to control verbosity and details, uh, how detailed the uh, decoding of syscalls and printing of them is going to be, uh, uh, whether, to, whether to print signals, uh, whether to dump uh, data, because a stress can dump data, uh, uh, that which is read from or written to um, specified file descriptors. Uh, also, you can redirect output to files and pipelines. There is also traditional syscall filtering. Uh, there are also means to collect and display statistics by <coughs> timing spent in system calls, uh, number of calls, number of files, uh, how to sort this and how to print this and so on. There's also ways to control a stress behavior in different ways, like whether to create processes or attach to already existing processes, whether to follow uh, child processes, and so on. So this is more or less about traditional stress. I'm not going to, to talk about traditional features. They are more or less known to you, I think, I hope. Yes? Okay, so modern, modern features there, you can also sp split them into several groups, like the way how to control output, you can, you can print uh, information associated with descriptors, you can print uh, um, stack of function calls, uh, you can control how to print named constants and flags. Uh, we have quite elaborate syscall partials. I will at least show at least one of them. Uh, there is more features how to filter syscalls. Like, now you can filter syscalls by paths, use regular expressions. There are also new classes. Uh, also more features how to uh, collect and, and print uh, statistics and more ways to control a stress behavior. Uh, we'll talk about this a bit later. There's, there are also more ways to print, to collect and print more detailed information uh, than a stress does by default. <coughs> so let's, yeah. And the last but not least <laughs> is system call tampering. That's something completely different uh, compared to all we know about a stress. So, 
life. I'll start about start with something more or less traditional, which is system call filtering. And this is a this example you can see a, was a real problem like a year ago. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, there used to be just one syscall called open in the Linux kernel, and then open at was added quite some time later. And then new architectures appeared that don't have open syscall anymore. And the last, no, not really last, uh, the year before last, in GNU-LibC 2.26, uh, they, they changed the implementation of open to invoke open at syscall on all architectures, not just on new ones, but also on traditional architectures. And what happened is that all scripts that used to filter open syscall, they stopped working because they, there, there, there are no more open syscalls invoked by GNU-LibC. So people changed their scripts to, to trace open ed, and then they found out, some of them, that the script don't, no longer work like with older GNU-LibCs, and if they deal with statically linking programs, that is completely mm, uh, unpredictable situation because you can end up with an executable or a library that invokes both open and open access calls because of the way these are uh, uh, different parts of uh, different implementations ended up in this executable. So the traditional way to deal with this is just to list to system calls. But as I said, as you, as you, as you probably remember, uh, not all architectures uh, know about open syscalls. So this uh, traditional approach just doesn't work. Uh, on these architectures. So if you write a portable script, e e this is not the, the right way to go because just a, a simple listen e is not portable. So what could be done here? Uh, yeah. So we added support of regular expressions. Uh, yeah, it was the year before last. Uh, can you imagine this? A regular expressions exist for, for, for many years, and it's so, so, so well supported in different software. And Astrace is also so many years old, but yet we got support for regular expressions just, just recently. Uh, that sounds strange, but it's a fact. Uh, so using regular expressions. Uh, you can solve this uh, this problem of listing syscalls. Uh, you just can like, say write slash open and list all and uh, filter all syscalls that contain substring open. Uh, but as usual in the kernel, uh, uh, because of differences between architectures uh, and other peculiarities, you can end up with a, not just with open and open ed, but as you can see with other <laughs> funny syscalls like, so people are lazy, they actually do this. I also do this, uh, but you know, if you get an open by handle ed, for example, then it's probably bad luck and you really should use a, a more accurate um, regular expression. By the way, uh, in this example, you can you can see output from a tool that's called AS Info, which stands for Advanced Syscall Information Tool. Uh, it's, it's really a uh, uh, not nice thing. I don't think you can get this information a, any other way. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, it's it's kind of part of a Strace project. But it's not merged into the main line, so it's not a um, part of any release yet, yet. But it's going to be, I promise. Uh, why it's not in any release? Because the command line interface is not yet stable, and once it's released, we'll have to provide compatibility for many years. So once the interface stabilizes, it will be 
uh, in the release. Uh, by the way, uh, why would you want to filter the calls at all? Why not to print everything and be happy about it? Well, sometimes you really don't know what you're looking for. And in this case, you really want to print everything and even maybe even a bit more than everything uh, because you really don't know what you're looking for. for in, a, in such cases, you just enable every extended tracing that trace can do. I'll talk about it a bit later. But when you know what you're looking for, for example, if this is a script that looking for something particular, like a filter of some kind, then you don't want to uh, for, for unrelated output to get into uh, into your way, uh, maybe confuse your script because some some uh, like if it handles arbitrary strings, these strings can look like other uh, uh, calls. Who knows? So the idea is that if you don't know, you print everything. But if you're looking for something in particular, it's better to use filtering. And after all, trace works better uh, when it traces only a subset of these calls. And for a trace, it's important to work back faster. Like. Uh, um, besides regular expressions, uh, uh, more system call classes were introduced. Uh, in addition to traditional system call classes listed here, uh, we introduced system call classes uh, for stat family syscalls. Uh, why for stat family? Uh, this is uh, just an example of one of these system call classes. Uh, why stat, stat family? Because it's also uh, quite big and quite complicated and quite different between architectures. So um, by using um, stat family syscalls, you can, they are like old enough and big enough and complicated enough that you can trace maybe a history of the Linux kernel, as you can see on the next slide. Uh, but here, on this example, you can also see, uh, besides the, the, this new class, you can see uh, uh, one of methods of extended tracing, dash y option, that prints path names associated, associated with uh, descriptors. So, uh, what about start families, of course? <laughs> It's quite complicated. Uh, uh, first, these calls uh, that were in the Linux kernel from the beginning was they were start, L start, and F start. And then a new editions of those syscalls were added, and uh, uh, start, F start, and L start were renamed to old with old prefix. Then on 32 bit architectures, 64-bit uh, analogs for these syscalls were added. And then Statet family syscalls were uh, introduced. And finally, uh, the year before last, I think, static syscall were added. Uh, uh, it was added to, like, to replace all of them. But you know that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how, do, how, would you, how long would it take to replace all of these traditional and legacy syscalls? Well, you can assume more or less that old syscalls, uh, the prefix old, they are more or less obsolete. Almost nowhere you can find, besides tests, besides probably stress tests, you, <laughs> you won't find anywhere else uh, in, in live projects use of old syscalls. But, uh, for example, in glibc, uh, the wrapper for statics, it was added just in the last release, 2.28 last summer. So before that, uh, all applications they, they expected to, they, that wanted to use statics, they would have to invoke it directly, uh, like syscall, just direct syscall. And even 
even if it's available in glibc, uh, what you can do, uh, you can't assume that it, this is called is available uh, because it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be always available because the kernel may be not fresh enough. So it would have to handle a situation when it's not available. Uh, what does it mean for strays and for strays users? That you can't assume that everything uses this or that particular uh, stat, stat family syscall. So if you want to list all stat syscalls, you have to use, and you can't list them, as you see. They are all different between architectures and even IBs. So the best way to handle this if you want to filter this is called it is to use classes. You probably can write a regular expression uh, to describe this, but it's much easier to, to use classes. Oh, while talking about <coughs> extended tracing, uh, I mentioned dash y option, and if you type it twice, you'll get even more information associated with descriptors. In this example, you can see <coughs> Are how this information is extended while these descriptors are getting more and more connected. For example, like uh, while when the circuit is just created, it's just a TCP circuit, but when it's connected, a trace can print more information, uh, uh, source and destination address and port, for example. Uh, Another feature that relates to stress output is state tracing. Not really tracing, but you can ask a stress to print a user function, uh, a stack of user function calls during system call invocations. Uh, like in this uh, example, uh, you can see that cat utility for some reason closes to the out on exit. And if you don't know why this happens, if, if you uh, want to check uh, the system call to application logic, you can enable stack tracing. Uh, in this example, you can see that this close happens just from names of glibc functions. It looks like a it's being called uh, from an exit hunter. Why this could be, why, why cat does this, you think? It's probably, it has to ensure that everything that it has to write is actually written. So if it, if it isn't, then it has to uh, exit with a non-zero exit code. And in some cases, like when it writes into network descriptors, it might happen that write syscall succeeds but close isn't because it isn't actually written. So it makes sense for cat to do this. But without stack tracing, you just, all you have is to guess what's going on. Uh, by the way, in this example, you can see, uh, besides this dash k option also, uh, the way how to filter syscalls by path names they access. In this example, a trace shows only those syscalls that have something to do with, with slash dev slash full device. So when it is useful when you really don't know what's going on, or for example, when you think that you know what's going on, but the application is like multi-threaded and quite <coughs> complicated, and when something goes wrong, uh, and you want to trace it back to application level. And such situations, this can help. And another feature to control a stress output is dash x option. It's quite a recent addition. Uh, it allows you to print uh, named constants in, like numeric constants in different ways. Uh, the traditional one is to print them symbolic when they are actually match some, 
some symbolic constants. But sometimes what happens is that some software, uh, probably because GNU-LibC doesn't implement uh, wrappers for all these calls or for, for portability, because it now implements but uses it to miss some sys calls. Some software actually implements or they, they own wrappers and they are not very well portable and what happens is that they sometimes confuse sys call arguments. Uh, it shouldn't sound surprising because uh, sys call, uh, even number of arguments of sys calls is not portable across architectures and even semantics can differ. So if you suspect that an application confuses uh, syscall arguments, you can print both uh, raw values and symbolic values uh, and see the problem. Because it makes little sense to print uh, numerics in symbolic form uh, if application really confuses this. For example, like in this open ad, the, the first argument and the third argument, they are both symbolic, uh, they are both numeric, but they have different semantics. Uh, another, another application I've been told last year that uh, a tool from Cisco project also uses uh, a trace dash x row output uh, to convert um, trace logs from a trace to produce Cisco programs. <coughs> okay, let's move on to statistics. So in addition, in addition to traditional uh, statistics are what shows how much time is spent in syscalls. Uh, now you can also, I mean, system time. In addition to this, now you can, you can ask a trace to print the real time spent in syscalls. Uh, when, oh, when it could be useful? Because some system calls sleep a lot. Uh, you know, not just nano sleep. Don't be confused with the prefix nana. It sleeps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the main purpose of nano sleep is to sleep. But other syscalls could sleep, for example, uh, when they're waiting for input output completion. And in some cases, the bottleneck is not the number of syscall invocations, but in the amount of time they sleep. Uh, uh, for example, it's not a really rare case when, uh, uh, when delays have been added to an application to work around some problems, and then maybe some, a, a few days later, either problems disappeared or even people disappeared. Uh, it happens, but those delays, they left forgotten, and yet a few days, a few years later, you end up with a program that, that does something you can get. So in such cases, uh, uh, you can use uh, this uh, statistic gathering to, to uncover um, cases like this. Uh, yeah. Yet another option to control a trace behavior. As you know, a trace is not very transparent uh, to program set traces. Uh, for example, when a trace uh, runs a program, it, it's also uh, not just its tracer, but also its parent. Uh, so, uh, as you can see in this example, the tracer sees a trace as its parent, not the program that invoked a trace. And sometimes it's not desirable. Uh, and there is a way to, to make a trace more transparent. With just using dash D option, you can make a trace go to, to the ground almost immediately. Uh, as you can see in this example, uh, 
the parent process of the tracer is the process that involved a trace, not a trace itself. When it could be useful? There are actually many situations when you want to uh, make a trace more transparent. For example, if you want to trace the whole container, the whole processes, we just invoke just invoke init under stress dash d, and stress will be p one process for a very very short time, and then it will go to the ground and replace itself. Uh, I mean p one with a real init. Uh, besides options, we have, as I said, more elaborate parses, uh, and this is probably the most elaborate one that handles most popular netting protocols. Uh, in this very small example, you can see our, our routing table for an almost empty, almost empty network namespace where you can see there is just a Lubeck device uh, with default, default routing. And if you run this comment under stress, you will see this. Uh, you probably guess the pattern that are these four lines, you can guess them. Uh, does it work? You can go back. You can just go forward with this device. So, yeah, it's quite elaborated. Uh, and NetLink route is not the most complicated of NetLink protocols. There's also NetFilter, which is even more complicated. And Strace now can decode this. Uh, there is also a, a small script, a uh, utility intended to, intended to uh, aggregate uh, trace logs when it could be useful. When you are, for example, sometimes it's useful to, um, to keep logs of different processes in, in spread files. Uh, <coughs> this way you can get rid of get rid of these interrupted resumed markers, and sometimes it's easier to handle them by scripts, but when you want to look at the result with your own eyes, and uh, when you're looking for some pattern you don't know what you're looking for, then it's useful to aggregate these traces back. And the best way to aggregate them is to use the program that already does this properly. Uh, it's a, it's a part of a, a stress project, so it's covered by tests. Uh, it's much better to use a program that's already tested than to write your own. And, you know, you'll have a lot of opportunities to write your own mistakes. There is no need to repeat mistakes made by others. Okay, so the last but not least is the new feature uh, that's quite revolutionary for a trace because a trace used to be a tracing tool and now uh, with addition of system call tampering now it's something completely different i mean it it can trace as it used to trace before but it also can tamper with processes the first method of tampering we added it was a system called fault injection. Uh, like fault injection in general, it's a, it's a well-known tool for testers. It's used to like, simulate situations that are not easy to uh, reproduce in reality. Uh, and in case of a trace, when you can inject faults into syscalls, uh, it's really, really handy and really easy to do. Uh, and this way, a trace became a, a testing tool. Actually, we use syscall fault ejection to test some parts of a trace itself. Uh, especially, <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, because some code paths are not easy to trigger, like error paths, and also some some decoders uh, only work when the process is privileged and when you want to test uh, uh, without too many privileges. It's uh, also uh, a good opportunity. So yeah, this is a just, a, just a, a simple example. But besides testing, 
uh, fault injection could be used to actively look for bugs. These are quite old examples, as you can see, Python 3.5 is a history nowadays, but uh, when this feature was written uh, during, uh, yeah, it was, okay, so it was just a, a prototype of the feature, but the author of, of the prototype, he was looking for bugs in different projects, and he found this <laughs> pretty one that Python 3 used to ignore um, <laughs> return codes of uh, file operations with slash dev slash your random device. And it led to the situation that it accessed, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, hexadecimal address 50. It's a probably uh, some method from an object uh, that's mapped at the null address. So just when it ignored all these errors, it ended up with a crash. Uh, fortunately, uh, the bug was fixed in Python 3.6, I think, but that, it's funny, no uh, Another s bug that was found using this uh, fault injection feature, uh, it was a bug in Glibc dynamic linker. Uh, it's usually good in checking return codes, but in one spot it ignored return code from Emperor Texas call, and the result was that some region of memory that expected to be uh, to be made inaccessible, it remained accessible, so it probably could be considered as a bug with security implications. So, yeah, I found it, I fixed it. You shouldn't think about it anymore. But, yeah, this way you can <coughs> use fault injection to look for bugs. Uh, after syscall fault injection, other kinds of injections were added, uh, like return value injection, not just necessarily an error. Uh, uh, you probably don't want to inject um, return values to any kind of syscall, because how it works, uh, like in case of fault injection, it cancels the syscall itself, and uh, on exiting syscall, it injects the error value, and in case of return value injection, it also cancels the syscall and injects something uh, that is specified. Uh, so if a syscall is expected to write something into user memory, it's probably not a, not a good idea to inject uh, a re return value because nothing is going to be written. But for those syscalls that don't write into user memory, and for example, just return zero on success, you can do this. Uh, uh, this example is actually modeled uh, uh, on a real case. We, we, used, we had to debug an application that uh, wrote uh, into many temporary files and then passed these temporary files on to other applications and then removed them. And some bug crept in and some of these temporary files got something it shouldn't get. Uh, and the easiest way to analyze this was to cancel uh, removal of these temporary files. It's a really simple thing to do, and the application was unaware of this trick we did with it, and we could analyze these temporary files almost for free. Yeah, yeah and the bug was fixed, fortunately. Uh, and yet another kind of injection, it's probably the last one I'm going to talk about is a delay injection. Uh, why would you want to inject delays? Isn't this trace slowing down everything <laughs> enough already? <laughs> well, the keyword here, like in other kinds of injections, is targeted. It's a targeted <coughs> delay injection that's useful, like in syscall injection, return value injection, uh, when it could be useful. Uh, some programs think, uh, I mean, they are authors of the thing, that if they uh, write uh, 
a sleep for a specified time and they expect that it will sleep this amount of time. So they code in some expectations from a Linux kernel that is not guaranteed to, to provide. Uh, for example, yeah, in this case for sleep, uh, if syscall uh, is asked to sleep for one second, it doesn't, it can sleep, well, it will sleep at least one second, that's true. But in modern, uh, in the modern world, with all these virtual machines and funny, uh, funny schedules, uh, you can get into like one second and a half. I've seen even three seconds in, in, in OBS where we uh, also, uh, we use OBS to test the trace like in other environments. And so you can't really expect that the specified amount of sleep in a syscall will take exactly this time. And some applications actually do this. And this is the way to, um, to replicate this situation in a reliable way. Uh, so it can, it can be used for regression testing like, like syscall fault injection. Uh, besides this, you can use this to, uh, for example, to slow down some operations, for example, uh, to slow down some specific network operations. Like, imagine if you have an application that can generate a lot of traffic, but doesn't have its own means to limit it. So you can, using filtering, uh, you can target delays of very specific syscalls that generate output and this way you can um, like slow down it as much as you like. And this, uh, this example is really artificial because you don't normally have to slow down any uh, write operations to devnull. Uh, devnull is, uh, it can accept any data as fast as you can write it there. But this is a way to demonstrate the, the feature. As you can see in this example, the, the measure of slowdown by DD itself is like from five gigabytes, five, yeah. So it's about three orders of magnitude slower when, <coughs> when in a normal situation. So this is really more or less, I would like to talk about modern features today. Uh, as you can see, Strace is not just a very old project, really old. It's a probably a few months older than a Linux kernel, but still, uh, like, a, a, uh, like a Linux kernel, it's quite a live project still. Uh, and we are still adding, we are still adding new features and more features are coming. So now I'm ready for your questions and suggestions. Do I have to repeat questions? Yeah. I'll do my best, but if I'm <coughs> forgetting to repeat them, please remind me. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so on an earlier slide, you had a couple of, maybe you could go back to slide 25. I don't know whether, ah, yeah, I can do this. Uh, yeah, in, in this one invocation of S-Trace, you have a slash unlink. What, what is the slash and prefix? It's a regular expression. Oh, it's part of the regular expression. Yeah, it's the, the regular expression feature because it could be unlink or unlink at. Okay. And, uh, and I don't want to bother about this anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sorry, the, the question was uh, uh, about slash unlink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reminded, <laughs> sounding questions in reverse notation. I'll first answer them and then I will sound. <laughs> Sorry, is that P, uh, P trace? Do you use other method to, to, to capture like uh, DPF, for instance? So the, the classic method is P trace. Uh, so the question was whether uh, we still use P trace interface or do we have. Uh, um, BPF-based 
uh, methods. Uh, so far, we use Pitrace, which is a, a, it was a GSOC project last year <coughs> to use Secomp, which is also Pitrace, but you can save like uh, half of uh, context switches uh, on by avoiding, or even more of them, by avoiding those syscalls that you are not interested in. So, it's still Pitrace, but this Secomp filtering, you can save some space. With regards to BPFs, uh, it's, it's probably our future, but not the nearest one. Uh, well, BPF is a root-only thing. It's a first. There are serious, very strict limitations on the size of programs you can do. And Im imagine how much space would it take to produce this. Uh, the, probably you would have to uh, to fetch raw data and then process it in the user space. So it's still like not really under development, but we're still thinking about this. It's a way to go, but the road is unclear. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, can you combine the minus P with the injection? So you <coughs> uh, all access to slash TMP is really slow. Can you combine minus P with oh. injection? I think, I <laughs> bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, please, yes. You, you have an option to, to grab the read and write from uh, file descriptor. Can you specify on the file descriptor the web flows the name or even a regular expression of the file or PCP or something? We, uh, so, yeah. The question was, can we combine uh, dumping of data with, sorry, with what, with? So, um, uh, could you repeat the question, sir? something you specify in the file descriptor and like three, can you specify the like part of the file name, the part of the whole, this connection, I don't know, based on some criteria like destination ID or port, this question. So, the question was, as I got it, is whether you can specif whether you can read uh, 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 combine dumping of uh, of dump combine dumping of data with filtering with syscall filtering of some kind, uh, and the answer is yes, yes. You you can specify syscalls you want to filter and then dump data associated with descriptors uh, you specified. So the answer is yes, if I got the question right. Any more questions? We still have a few minutes, I think. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I was trying to explain when I was working on secrets, the IOCDL under the end of the secret IOCDL and what you saw before. Is there any kind of plugin on S3 so you can load the plugins and the code some additional stuff like so the question is whether Strace supports plugins, plugins that could be loaded and ex extend Strace in in any way. So the answer is no. Uh, I don't think Strace supports any plugins. There is no API for this. Uh, I mean, Strace was not designed for this. Uh, so if we are going to add support for Plugins would have to design an API. Uh, uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, so there is, there is a project to. Are you recorded or do I have to repeat all the things you said? I can just conclude with you. Okay. Uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there was a GSOC project that had support for Lua, and for it, uh, yeah. and for it, uh, you, well, with Lua, you can just add arbitrary record uh, which is executed. Uh, each Cisco location or Cisco entering and exiting, and that way you can just uh, load any additional arbitrary record and execute arbitrary record. But in Visual, it's a bit experimental and shows that. So, yeah, it, the, in short, it's not matched yet. What's so, the name of the process? 
Uh, well, it's a branch available in the spaces, GitHub is already, like who was hunting. Oh, okay. so it's a branch. Yes. Yes. I would like to add to this that uh, writing uh, plugins, it's a completely different level of complexity and a stress is expected to be like easy to use. And this is like writing code, not involving <coughs> it uh, in a stress. So it's not the target audience for a stress is to writing new extensions. So yeah, for example, in case of Lua scripts, it's not an easy thing to write a Lua script compared to writing a, any command you can see in this example. Even the, the most complex one, uh, like, the, like fault injection, it's the most complex one, but still it's much, much, much easier than to write a law script. Uh, yeah, anyone? Yes, please. Uh, can you have multiple fault injections on the same? Excuse me, uh, could you tell it a bit louder? Uh, could you have multiple fault injections on the same fault? Multiple. For example, so the question or is: Could you uh, uh, could you do multiple fault injections on a on a single system call? Yes. Uh, the answer is probably no, because we don't issue new syscalls. What we do is we substitute the, the system call with a with a not a system call, and then inject an error. On exit, we don't change uh, the control flow. We substitute this call with another system call. Uh, so to inject several uh, several faults, you would have to inject more system call invocations. Yeah, but for instance, on PyScript 2, you have a return, and on PyScript 3, you have another return on the same system call. Sorry? So you have the when close, you have the syscall close. You can have the same syscall. And I'm not sure I get the, the question. Uh, uh, and we are almost out of time. So, so. Uh, uh, currently there is only one uh, injection can, uh, can be configured per Cisco uh, type, like per Cisco. And, uh, but you can uh, configure like uh, different types of uh, injection simultaneously. Like you can simultaneously do the uh, injection and and okay. simultaneous injection and so on. Uh, so, but otherwise, it's, yeah, it's a limitation. It can be every can but it another. <laughs> this is a project that is not merged yet, but that allows advanced uh, Cisco filtering. Uh, there, you basically can specify multiple uh, like kinds of transactions for different subsets of uh, Cisco. So, Cisco locations. So, thank you very much. Uh.